Good morning and welcome to Trinity Bible Church of Dallas. Um, we're going to worship God this morning and start by standing to sing the doxology. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, um, this gift of life that you've given us today and the ability to come here this morning on this Lord's day to worship you, Lord. Uh, we pray that everything that's done this morning may be honoring to you, may be glorifying to you, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. Um, Lord, we thank you that you know all things and uh, you know all the needs of the congregation, Lord. And we ask that you would meet those needs um, in your timing and according to your will and enable us to trust you uh, amidst those trials. Lord, we thank you uh, for the ultimate gift that you have given us in your son uh, in whom we can have forgiveness for the redemption of sins. Um, and so we just thank you that you made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, Lord. Uh, and we thank you that we can gather to get today as your people to give you honor and to give you praise uh, for saving sinners like us. Um, Lord, we ask that you would be with the believers that are gathering in other parts of our city and other parts of our state and country and around the world, Lord, um, that uh, they would offer up uh, an aroma soothing to you in their uh, worship services this morning as well, and that you'd be glorified through your name being proclaimed throughout the whole earth. And Lord, we ask that if anyone here does not know you, that you would give them the gift of repentance and faith, that you would uh, remove their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Uh, you would help them to see their sin uh, and their need to be reconciled to you, and you'd ultimately enable them to put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in his name. Amen. You may be seated. If you are a visitor with us this morning, welcome. We are glad you are here. We have a gift for you, a free MacArthur Study Bible, and you can get one of those in the lobby. So make sure you get one on the way out. And if you would like one in Spanish, those are in the orange cover. Uh, so Y'all probably already noticed, but today we started back our normal schedule. So we had Sunday school, and so the early service started at 8 instead of 8.30. And then Sunday school starts at 9.30 in this service at 10.45, which will keep this schedule going forward. Next Sunday, we'll be continuing our series in Psalms with uh, Jay Lennington, who will be joining us from Grace Church, and he will be going over Psalm 32. The choir is still looking for more singers, and so if you would like to join the choir, uh, you can find out information on that in the bulletin, and it's not too late. The first choir practice will actually be this evening. And so if you'd like to join that and looking for an opportunity to serve, you can find information on that in the bulletin. Trinity's Women of the Word, the Women's Bible Study, will be starting this week on Tuesday night. And so they will be going through prayer unveiled, understanding its theological dimensions. And if you have not RSVP, make sure you RSVP for that. So that starts this Tuesday night. And if you can't make it Tuesday night, there's actually a replay on Thursday morning. And so both those times are in the bulletin. Next Sunday, we'll be observing corporate prayer before the early service. So that starts at 715, and that'll be at Herb's house. On Wednesday, September 20th, we will be having a night of worship. And it is directed towards young adults, but anyone is welcome to come. And so there will be scripture reading, uh, the gospel message will be proclaimed, and there will be uh, many songs that will be sung. And that's Wednesday, September 20th. And then two weeks from today, on September 24th, we will be serving the evening meal at Dallas Life. 
And uh, Dallas Life is a Christian-based homeless recovery sh shelter that exists to radically transform the lives of homeless people through biblical accountability-based recovery programs. And so if you're looking for an opportunity for service, um, that would be a great way uh, to serve our uh, city. And that is in the bulletin. You can find information on that and contact Canyon JRO. With that, we're going to stand and sing our first hymn, I Sing the Mighty Power of God, number 26 in the hymnal. Continues. <clears throat> Please continue singing our next song for this morning, number 206, Jesus, What a Friend for Sinners.
Please continue singing number 86, Great is Thy Faithfulness. For our last song this morning before the sermon, we're going to be singing through Psalm 3, which is actually the, the passage for today, in following Ephesians 5, 19, which is to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Over the next five to six weeks, as we have the uh, preachers preach through different psalms, we're going to, where there is a good and singable version, going to be singing through a psalm in advance of the message to prepare ourselves for the sermon. For Psalm 3, uh, to get us familiar with the melody, which is, it's, the tune is Finlandia, but hopefully you all should be familiar with it. We will sing through the first verse uh, to get everyone familiar, and then we'll repeat back through that and sing the rest of the song.
seated. Well, good morning. Uh, um, we're very thankful to have Austin Duncan here. He is a great friend of our church, a great friend of mine. Uh, we debated whether he we should give him an introduction, and he said, I'd really appreciate one. So anyway, I, I've got some notes here, and he said, just speak from your heart. And I said, well, I got nothing in my heart, so I'm just going to have to read this <laughs> anyway about him. Austin Duncan is the staff pastor and elder at Grace Community Church in Los Angeles, and he's the pastor of a very large ministry with the college and so he's been there over a decade, and um, he's also the director of the MacArthur Center for Expository Preaching. And I want to direct you, if you can, to get the podcast that he does. They've got over a million and a half listeners on that, and it's really one of the best things you've done, Austin. So we are very thankful to have Austin. He really is a good friend. There are a few things in my heart, but anyway... We're thankful you're here. We look forward to your exposition of Psalm 3. Thank you, Kent. I knew you had something in your heart. I knew it. Uh, it's, just, it's just a great encouragement to see somebody who you spent hours and hours with in a deer blind, pouring out your soul, have to Google you to introduce you. So that's, that's really touching, Kent. Just really touching. Uh, the intimate friendship, it's just, you know, yeah. Love you too. Love you too. Uh, it is a joy to be here, and uh, introductions unnecessary. Uh, I've been among you many times, and it's always a pleasure to open God's Word with you, such an attentive church who believes in the Scripture. Uh, you love the Word of God, and, and obviously an adventure in the Psalms, which you're Setting out on is, is an adventure in a place in the Scripture that's one of your favorites. Uh, Christians love the Psalms. We're drawn to the Psalms. It's a place where we express our uh, affections. We find expression for our affections and for our sorrows and, and for our joy. Uh, one author calls the Psalms a songbook for all seasons of the soul. Catch that? A songbook for all seasons of the soul. Likewise, Calvin said... Uh, the Psalms are, are an anatomy of the human soul. It's, it's the, the entirety of, of who you are in your uh, most truest expression of yourself. The eternal uh, part of you that will last forever uh, is expressed in uh, repentance and joy and sometimes anxiety and sorrow and salvation throughout these, these famous songs whether it's the familiar uh, song of the shepherd, Psalm 23, or the, the lengthy exposition of the Word of God in Psalm 119, or that tiny but mighty center of the Psalms with 117, uh, all 150 songs are, are a place where the believer's heart is drawn to, and they help us to see what we sometimes struggle to have the words to say, in our times of prayer or devotion or, or worship before the Lord. Uh, there's no doubt that the psalm before us, Psalm 3, is reflective of something both familiar to us in a psalm of faith or trust and something less familiar to us in a category of the psalms called lament. Uh, the psalms are a songbook, just like the, the hymn book in some of your chairs there. 
a collection of, of songs written by various authors over centuries. Uh, the oldest psalm is Psalm 90, penned by Moses. Uh, David is the most prominent and uh, pro prolific of the authors of the psalms. There's groups of composers like the sons of Korah. There's Ethan. There's uh, a variety of, of authors and, and genres in the songs. But in the psalms, what you, what you don't see in our modern hymnody, in our modern song collections, are many songs of lament, of lament. A lament is a song of trouble, a song of tears, a mournful song, a song suited to a world like ours, a, a fallen world. And I think it's because most people don't want to acknowledge that, you know, that's why they fill a stadium and call it a church in Houston. So, you know, they, they just want plastic grin. They don't, they don't want to deal with realities, stark realities. Uh, they want something positive and affirming, uh, even if they shouldn't be positive or affirmed. And so lament is a, is a missing category, though. There are some songs that we know. The most famous uh, modern song of lament is probably It's Well With My Soul, right? Peace Like a River. Uh, that, that song we know very well. William Cooper in the 18th century wrote, God moves in mysterious ways. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. Uh, the clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and will break in blessings on your head. That was a man who understood kind of the, the minor key of Christian experience. Less well known, a song in the hymnal by Anne Steele, written in the early 1700s, called Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul. She penned these words, Dear refuge of my weary soul, on thee when sorrows rise, on thee when waves of trouble roll, my fainting hope relies. To thee I tell each rising grief, for thou alone can heal. Thy word can bring a sweet relief for every pain I feel. I mean, that, that's it, isn't it? An anatomy of all parts of the soul. There are times when it's difficult to find a song appropriate for our troubles. And Psalm 3 is one of those songs, one of those songs that's suitable for trouble in hard times. Psalm 3 is considered an individual lament by those who categorize the songs, and there's 39 other individual laments in the Psalter. But if you add the corporate lament, the congregational laments, and the individual laments together, you know how many of the songs fit in that category? 62. And I think that's remarkable. 62 of the 150 psalms, what, what's the percentage of that, Ken? It's 41% of the psalms are lament psalms. I mean, that's almost half. That's an incredible amount of, of songs that are intended to express the believer's sorrow and the believer's expression of trust in pain and suffering and tragedy and difficulty and repentance and grief. And it's, I think it's notable that Psalm 3 is in the front of the songs. These are, there's, there's great wisdom in the arrangement of the psalms. You know, Psalm 1 stands as a sentry. Uh, I think Spurgeon was, was the one that said it's, it's a sentry, a guard, saying there's two ways to live. As you enter this book, you're either going to go the way of the righteous or the way of the wicked. And there's only two paths, two, two destinies, two ways, and only one way to be blessed by God. That's the message of Psalm 1. Psalm 2 is a message about God's kingship, the, the nation's rage, the people's plot in vain, uh, but there's God on his throne laughing at those who would dare oppose his kingship and then speaking of his sovereign king installed on the throne and, and a warning and an invitation, kiss the son, son uh, lest his wrath be kindled and he become angry in the way. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Psalm 3 follows those two. Psalm 3 follows Psalm 1 and 2. Such insights to follow. That's, that's the deep stuff I have for you today. Uh, but th it's, its front position is important because what we see in Psalm 3 is that this, this traditionally seen as a morning prayer, uh, like an in-the-morning prayer of trust in God, is one that's suitable for the believer's troubles. And whether you're in a period of your life where you're, you're going through it, you're going through difficulty, suffering, sorrow, or it's on the horizon, this beginning of the Davidic collection, Psalm 3 through 41, 
gives you this song of sorrow, confusion, despair, and difficulty in the form of a prayer with notes that are certainly missing from our, our modern expressions of worship, right? The imprecation is what it's called in verse seven, arise, O Lord, save me, for thou hast smitten all the enemies on the cheek, thou hast shattered the teeth of the wicked. I mean, that's violent. The, the Psalm 3 version we just sang, they took the teeth out of that thing, right? I mean, you, you don't sing, smite the broken teeth of them. That's too, that's not Christian. So, you know, this is such a, such a unique song and such a song of, of conveyance of how to hang on to God when it's hard to do that. What else is in this song? I think predominantly it's a song of faith a song that exudes faith and trust and assurance and confidence. And that's very typical of these sad songs in the song book. Trouble, lament, judgments, all coming together with trust. And so this really is a song of trouble and trust. And that's your sermon title if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, trouble and trust, a song of trouble and trust. And what else sets this song apart, something I love about it, is it has a superscription. It has a historical context. Most psalms do not. Most psalms have maybe a musical notation, a mysterious Hebrew word. We've lost the sense of shigion or something like that. But this one tells you exactly what the occasion, the context, the provocation of this song was in its superscription. And that's really where we need to start is looking at that very, those tiny letters. If your eyes can see them, for some reason, these, these are in the original, but the, the people who design Bibles forget, you know, about people that have eye problems. So you just stick your face real close to it, and you can see it. It says, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. And that's where I want to begin. Before we even get into Psalm 3, to understand what would have been the occasion of this song of trouble and trust... Let's dive into the, the background just, just a little bit. I don't want to get in the weeds, but you've got to get the context, the flavor, the texture of this song to understand it. And, and I think it'll help it even resonate more in your heart. So you've got 2 Samuel in your Bible. Why don't you try to find it and flip over there and we'll, we'll kind of jump around. I just want to have you have some familiarity with, with 2 Samuel. Maybe go to like chapter 14 would be a good place to kind of park and all. I'll move through there a little bit, and then we'll come back to, we'll come back to uh, Psalm 3. So where, where are we in this song of trouble and trust? Well, you know about King David, right? Everybody knows about King David, David and Goliath, you know, little, little shepherd boy turned king. Well, that's the first Samuel story. That's the journey from shepherd to king, and the, God gives his people a king according to their own desires, a king that they wanted, a a king like Saul. And from that king comes the true anointed king. Saul is replaced because of his disobedience to God, and God chooses a shepherd boy named David. And 1 Samuel is the story of David's rise from shepherd to king. And 2 Samuel is the book where David is on his throne. And the most notable story in 2 Samuel, the one we remember so well, is the story of sin in chapter 7, where David commits sin with Bathsheba, and the cover-up with Uriah as he hatches his murderous plot. And 2 Samuel is, is a portrait of the fragility of this kingdom. Uh, but it's Absalom who really requires our attention to understand Psalm 3. It's when David fled from his son Absalom. It's Absalom we need to get to know. Absalom was David's third-born son. You meet him first in 2 Samuel 3. His name ironically means my father is peace. And at the time of his birth, uh, that was the great hope and promise. But the years after David's sin with Bathsheba and his ensuing repentance, Israel is enjoying a period of international peace and stability. But there's strife in the king's house as Absalom and his brothers and sisters come of age. David is uh, eventually going to have to skip town. Absalom, uh, before that, uh, Absalom has to skip town. Absalom is put in exile. He's sent on the run because he orchestrated a revenge killing of his half-brother to avenge his sister. And so Absalom is, is on the run before David is on the run. And this self-imposed exile lasted three years. And by the time you get to 2 Samuel 14, where you are in your Bible, this is what it says. Look at verse 25. Now in all Israel, no one was as handsome as Absalom. 
so highly praised from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. There was no defect in him. And when he cut the hair of his head, and it was at the end of every year he cut it, for it was heavy on him, so he cut it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels by the king's weight. And to Absalom, there were born three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a woman of beautiful appearance. What a strange interruption in the narrative of royalty and kingship, this description of Absalom. It really says three things about him. Number one, he has good looks. Number two, he has a serious, serious head of hair. (laughs) Selah. (laughs) And number three, he has a family, right? Three sons and a beautiful daughter. Matthew Henry observes what's not said. There's nothing said of his wisdom and his piety. Absalom is big on looks and little on substance. And if you're reading through Samuel much, you remember probably in 1 Samuel the description of King Saul. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. He was tall. He was on the Israelite national basketball team. And and therefore, the people thought he should be a king. But he lacked substance. He lacked godliness. He lacked a commitment to Yahweh. Or maybe you remember when Samuel went to replace King Saul with one of the sons of Jesse, and they line up the sons, and Samuel says when he sees Eliab, the firstborn son of Jesse, David's oldest brother, Samuel says, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. And it wasn't. It wasn't the oldest. It wasn't the tallest. It wasn't the biggest. It wasn't the best looking. It was a boy out tending the sheep. That was God's chosen one. And the story of Saul is a lot like the story of Absalom. What you see with Absalom is he was, uh, he was all externals. It was all politics. It was all work in the crowd. By the time you get to chapter 15, Absalom's rebellion is well underway. 2 Samuel 15, uh, it says now, verse 1, it came about after this that Absalom provided for himself a chariot and horses and 50 men as runners before him. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. And it happened that any man had a suit to come to the king for judgment. Absalom would call to him and say, from what city are you from? And he would say, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom would say to him, see, your claims are good and right, but no man listens to you on the part of the king. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land. Then every man who had a suit or a cause could come to me, and I would give him justice. I mean, look at the description in verse 5. It happened that when a man came near to prostrate his, his self before him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. And in this manner, Absalom dealt with all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. What a mess. The chariots, the horses, the 50 attendants before him. He's putting on a show. He's setting up a rebellion. He's going after the people's hearts. He, he parks this whole setup in front of the ancient equivalent of the courthouse. People come to see the king, and they, they make it as far as Absalom. They, they know he's the king's son, so they bow down, and he says, oh, you don't, you don't need to bow to me. I'm not that kind of a prince. Stand up, brother brother, I'm with you. You know, I I wish there was more justice in this land. If somebody put me in charge, I'd do it. He's got his sleeves rolled up. He's got a hard hat on. He's shaking hands. He's a man of the people. He's kissing babies. You know the type. Your claims are good and right, he said. There was no plaintiff Absalom met that he didn't agree with, and he was dealing treacherously with his father's kingdom. And it says, Absalom dealt with all Israel in this manner. So he stole their hearts. He had this polished image, a feigned interest in people's problems. And like a politicking thief, he stole the people in a carefully crafted rebellion. And maybe you're thinking, well, this is what David deserves. And you'd be partly right because the consequences of the David and Bathsheba fiasco and Nathan told David in chapter 12 that a sword would never depart from his house because of the consequence of his sin. And not only that, he specifically says, I'll raise up evil within your household. I'll take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he'll lie with them in broad daylight, something that would be fulfilled 
in gross immorality in Absalom's rebellion as he takes over his father's palace. And so you'd be thinking maybe that David is getting his just rewards and you'd be right. But though David is suffering under the judgment of God and much of his trouble is a direct consequence of his own sin, nevertheless, David is God's rightful king. He's God's man. And rebellion against King David is ultimately rebellion against God himself, the God who put David in the throne in the first place. Yes, there's consequences for David's sin. According to Nathan, prophet Nathan, he was right. There's trouble in David's own household, but that doesn't excuse Absalom's evil deeds. David is still God's chosen king, and rebellion is still rebellion against God. And you can try to wrap your mind around that or explain it. You know, God sent this as judgment, but Absalom's responsible for the judgment, but better than explaining it is just extolling it because you're going to see it everywhere in the Bible and in your life. That's the intersection and the tension between God's sovereignty and human responsibility, right? I mean, we worship God because that's how he runs this world. Peter preached this like this in the book of Acts. Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, both, right? Sovereignty and responsibility. And that should provoke us to worship God. And David sees this. He sees the plot is already overwhelming the kingdom and he has no chance. So David abdicates his throne. There's no other option here. Uh, Absalom has won the entire hearts of the people and David has to run. He leaves the palace in fear for his life and flees Jerusalem with a ragtag handful of leaders still faithful to him. The clergy offers to go and bring the Ark of the Covenant and David. So much wisdom in this section of 2 Samuel. It's amazing to see how he's matured, how he's repented, how he's come uh, back in good fellowship with God because his wisdom's on display. And he tells the priest, don't bring the Ark, leave it, leave it there, which is maturity in David's part. He doesn't need the, the furniture of Yahweh. He needs the favor of Yahweh. He doesn't need the ritual. He, he, needs, he needs a righteous and right relationship. He needs repentance. And so he's trusting as he's retreating in what the Lord would bring. Who does he have with him? A handful of soldiers, some of them impressive, some of them is mighty men, but some of them are one guy named Berzillai. He was an octogenarian. That's who David had on his side, old guy. And as David retreated, he walked down that holy hill from Zion where the palace was, away from Jerusalem, away from God's city, crossing into the Kidron Valley towards the, the Mount Zion and then out to the, to the wilderness to ascend the Mount of Olives. The narrator tells us in Samuel that David is climbing. He's barefoot as part of the kind of sign of his humiliation. His head is covered in mourning as he weeps and he climbs and climbs. He hears the voice of one of his old rivals, this guy Shemai, an old trouble name maker who's still loyal to Saul's household. And this old guy's yelling at David saying, get out, get out, you man of blood. Get out, you scoundrel. The Lord repay you for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul, in the place you reigned. The Lord has handed his kingdom over to your son Absalom. You've come to ruin because you're a man of blood. And so now David is in exile. He has to flee the palace before he's killed by his own son. That's the occasion. That's the setting of Psalm 3. David's flight is the occasion for David's song of trouble and trust. David's flight is the occasion of David's faith. And David's faith is the foundation of David's song. He's been betrayed. He's been conspired against. He's outnumbered. This isn't merely some political trial, a thing of kings. This is intensely personal, as all trials are. And this is a song, though it's setting very different than our experiences is intensely personal like all trials are. And so I think it's a song not far off from our own troubles. So whether your trials are self-inflicted upon you uh, by sinful choices you made in your past, or if they're circumstantial things brought on by you don't know why, or sinful people are after you, David understands both of those things. Both missteps and miscreants because we all know trouble, and if you don't now, jot down these lessons from Psalm 3 because, friend, trouble's coming, and your troubles may not be national in scope, but they're personal and painful, and I know that your expectation of mercy can draw from and even exceed King David's 
as we look at this song in light of the shape of Calvary. So let's listen in. Let's listen in to a barefoot, dispossessed king who instead of a crown had his head covered in grief. Listen and you'll hear him weep and learn from the song that his tears brought. If you've ever faced trials and trouble, David has a song for you composed in four equal couplets divided by that word Selah, each one teaching us more about the relationship of trouble and trust and whether your trouble is now ongoing or on the horizon, mark it down because life in a fallen world is full of troubles and we need songs to express and sustain our trust. Psalm number three teaches us how to trust in trouble. Let's look at these first few verses. The first couplet I wanna call, the the heading on, on the first two verses is trouble and temptation. Verses one and two, trouble and temptation. Let's look at the text. Psalm three, verse one. O Lord, all caps, that's the covenant name of God, Yahweh. O Yahweh, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God, Selah. Here we have three lines of synonymous poetic parallelism. Uh, Our poetry in English, uh, dog, hog, blog. Uh, Poetry in Hebrew is parallelism. Uh, equal kind of lengths, sometimes uh, similar sounds, but they're, they're usually an idea that's building, and that's what's happening here in this poetic parallelism. All three lines are saying the same thing. This kind of poetry is meant to emphasize, to underline, to, to tap uh, on your attention, and, and to come to climax in the final word of verse two, the mocking words of his enemies. There is no deliverance for him in God. It seems at this point in David's existence to be far more enemies in his life than subjects, and the rising tide of disloyalty is only on the increase as he looks around and his foes are resisting him. It wasn't that long ago there were people singing songs about David. David has killed his 10,000s. The crowds were adoring him, but now there's a new generation that has come in and their hearts are with Absalom, and not only are they increasingly against him, these adversaries in verse one, it says, are rising up. The opposition to him is active, it's present. It's happening right now. They're in pursuit of him. Another thing that's clear in these poetic lines in verse one is that repeated word many, many in verse one. In my Bible, it uses the word increase, or maybe it says uh, more. It's the same Hebrew word, the word many, many are rising up against us. Many are saying of my soul, three times the word many appears repeatedly. And it appears later in the psalm as well, in verse six, that word ten thousandths has the same consonants as the Hebrew word for many. And so the, the outnumbered kind of scenario, the foes surrounding him, the many, many, many adversaries, many enemies all around, vocally ridiculing him. That's why this is trouble. The trouble is obvious, but verse one and two is trouble and temptation. The trouble's the threat of death. What's the temptation? Well, the temptation is to abandon his trust, to listen to the words of his enemies, to hear them say, there is no deliverance for him in God, and to believe that. Deliverance is a key word in this psalm. It's the Hebrew word for salvation or deliverance or help. And perhaps it's the words of that rascal Shammai ringing in his ears, man of blood, man of blood, you deserve everything you're getting. He knows his opponents are numerous and loud. And it's not that the voice of his enemies is doubting the power of God, it's worse than that. It's more personal because the enemies are assuming that God is on their side and against David. The great hope of the enemies is his apparent alienation from God. They see David's circumstances, barefoot, mourning, dispossessed, out in the wilderness, on the run from uh, people trying to kill him, and they say it's exactly what he deserves because God's not with him anymore. God won't save him. God won't answer him. They wrongly conclude that he's forsaken of God And it's not uncommon for God's enemies to talk like this and to make this mistake, but it's also not uncommon for us to be tempted to believe them. Some of you know what it's like to be taunted, belittled, to have your faith actively undermined and ridiculed. Verse two ends with the first occurrence of that word Selah in the Psalter. If you read the whole book, 150 Psalms, you'll find Selah 71 times. It's a word that we don't know what it means, probably a musical pause 
But some wise commentators like to think it means pause and think. Or better yet, pause and ask, what do you think of that? I mean, consider verse 2 in light of the Selah. There is no deliverance for him in God. What do you think about that? When trouble surrounds us and trials overwhelm us, it's of most critical importance that we do not believe a lie. Spurgeon said it this way, it's the most bitter of all afflictions to be led to fear that there is no help for us in God. David demonstrates for us the response of faith. And it's in the space between verses two and three, we see a massive change, a change of tone where David turns his attention from the numerous increasing rising vocal adversaries to fix his eyes on the omnipotence of God. And so the second couplet Verses three and four, let's call it trouble and trust. Trouble and trust, verse three, but thou, but thou, O Yahweh, art a shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. I was crying to Yahweh with my voice and he answered me from his holy mountain, Selah. The first word matters greatly here. And there's something happens in that white space between two and three because David gives an emphatic, contrastive kind of a word. He says, but thou, O Yahweh, showing us that massive chasm between verse two and three, between the rebellious masses mocking voices and Yahweh himself. And David says, but you, O Lord. And this is how we need to see our enemies, our critics, our adversaries, our trials, our troubles in this perspective, David sees his enemies suddenly in their true proportions as he turns his gaze from his circumstances, from his enemies to God himself, off of his adversaries, off of his trials, looking to God himself. And it's this where his eyes are becoming overwhelmed, no longer by his troubles, but by the person and nature and character of his God. That's the content of the second couplet. In verses three and four, we learn that when our eyes are on our troubles, we're overwhelmed. When our eyes are on God, we start to see everything clearly. I mean, there's countless examples of this in our lives and in our Bibles. The, the spies go into the promised land and 10 of them see only giants and certain death, death, death. And two of them have eyes of faith and think Yahweh's got this. I mean, there's a difference with that perspective, looking with faith or looking with fear, looking at circumstances or looking to God's word. It's all a matter of perspective, and the eye of faith sees differently. And it's here in verses three and four that David's trust begins to surface. And please note how prayerful this content is. Verse three, but thou, O Lord, who's he talking to? I mean, he's not talking to himself. There's times in the Psalms he speaks to himself. Here he's talking to God. This is a prayer, but thou, O Lord. Trust always begins with thou, O Lord, you, O Lord. Not about your faith or the, the quality of your faith or the quantity of your faith. It's about the object of your faith. It's not about the power of faith. It's about the person your faith is in. And David's trust is in God. That's why his prayer is, you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. This one commentator calls this whole psalm praying on the run. And when you're on the run, uh, to know that you have access to God in prayer is one of the realities that David is showing us. Because, friend, prayer is the ultimate acknowledgement of the sovereignty of God, isn't it? I mean, when you turn to God in prayer, you are saying, de facto, I don't have the answers. I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know where, where this is going but you, O oh God, it's an immediate pivot from earth to heaven that says, I need the sovereignty of God in full display in my mind and heart and emotions. And so David says, God, O oh God, or the God he's called out to repeatedly, and verse three and four are packed with God. He talks about God's nature, God's attributes, God's character, and God's actions. And it's what we need in our trials. It's how we face our trials with faith. So what does he say about God? What is his theology that comes out in his dark difficulties? Well, the first thing he says, oh God, you are a shield, a shield. God is his protector, a shield about me. This is a warrior writing this. This is a king. This is a, a commander of the Lord's army. He knows exactly what a shield is. 
And when he calls God a shield, he's saying, God is my protector. A shield about me, this warrior king. He knew his shields. He'd brandish his shield many times. Perhaps he was thinking of God's ancient words to Abram a thousand years prior, the first time this metaphor is used in Scripture. God says to Abram, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward will be very great. But most likely, David's just thinking of his favorite shiny shield. I mean, these were uh, made of like a wicker-like substance, like a light kind of wood, but they'd cover them with layers and layers of, of glistening kind of treated leather so they could glance off the blow of a sword or a javelin, two kind of shields in the ancient world, big kind of full body shields that uh, guys could move together against the, the archers and against uh, pressing armies or a, a personal kind of shield suitable for hand-to-hand -hand combat to fight one-on-one, -on -one, uh, to protect the torso and infantry as they're engaged with swords and spears. What a metaphor. The Psalms employ this picture readily and regularly. Psalm 10, uh, 7, 10, right, right on the same page, probably, my shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. David knew shields, and he knew there was no shield that could keep all the arrows away. No shield could block every sword and every spear, and no shield could stop an entire army unless God is your shield. And God was a shield to David, unassailable. It's why he uses a strong preposition in Hebrew, a shield about me or all around about me. He, he, David sees God as surrounding him, as his, uh, a field of protection that is invulnerable. David is Remember, humiliated, dispossessed, but David sees himself as secure. David was in such a vulnerable place, but David wasn't surrounded just by enemies. He was surrounded in his most intimate and real sense by the shield that was his God. Psalm 18, verse 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock by whom I take refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Well, what else does David say about God besides he's his protector, his shield? Well, he says, look at verse three, you're my glory. We think about the word glory as, as radiance, right? We think like, you know, the sun is, is glowing and has glory. But the Hebrew word glory isn't about shining, it's about weighing. The word is kavod, it means weight, or significance, heaviness, majesty, uh, standing is a good word for it, like you're standing in the community. That, that's what the word glory means in the Old Testament. And here's David, no longer hanging onto his crown, no access to his throne or palace, but he was not lacking for glory because God was his glory. David wasn't speaking of his own importance. David's significance was not in his kingship, Ultimately, he knew that that belonged to God. His glory was not in his former victories or possible deliverance in the future. David's glory is God himself. And I love this phrase. He says, oh Lord, art a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. For David, God was all sufficient. And it took him a long time to learn this. He's on the run, he knows it. He's, on, he's banking on this rich theological truth. This is such an assault to our self-importance, our self-perception, the way we view our standing, our influence, our significance. We need to be like David in this moment and say, it's not my glory, it's God's glory. It's his reputation that matters. And that's what I'm concerned about. The next little phrase is the lifter of my head. It means that David is God's restorer. It's a picture of the removal of shame, a picture of restoration, a picture of vindication from despair to hope. Related to David's glory, David says, I call out and he answers me. Well, what does it mean about God? It means that God is accessible. David calls out because he knows God can hear him. And in the Second Samuel narrative, there's a great example of this in David's just instinctual, automatic awareness of his need to ask for God's help. David had a counselor, his best advisor, his wisest counselor for military, political, any matter that pertained to the king's business, he would go to his guy, Ahithophel. Ahithophel was his wisest counselor and his chief advisor, and Ahithophel defected and went to Absalom. 
And David hears the news that his best counselor has joined his rebellious son. And do you know how he responds? He immediately prays, right there and out loud. He says, oh God, frustrate the counsel of Ahithophel. That's it. I mean, just a fast, quick prayer shot up to heaven. And God answers that prayer in a very unguessable way because Ahithophel was a great counselor, military strategist, and he told Absalom exactly what to do to get rid of David fully and finally. It was a perfect plan. And so Ahithophel told Absalom, go this way and do this. And Absalom, because he's an idiot, heard this wise counsel, this trusted counselor from his father's, you know, chiefest ranks, who says, go there. And so Absalom, because he's an idiot and sin makes you stupid, does this. And that's the moment that the coup fails, honestly, in the narrative. That's when everything turns towards David. Pretty soon there'll be 20,000 soldiers, rebellious soldiers dead in the forest of Ephraim, Absalom among them. David said, frustrate the counsel of Ahithophel. And how did that work? Somehow God, working all things together for his ultimate good in discipline and chastisement for David over his sin, in bringing about the prophecy of Nathan, in eventually bringing about a a reestablishment of David's throne. All of this is happening And it's happening in in David's just quick arrow prayer to God because as he says here in verse four, I was crying to Yahweh with my voice and he answered me from his holy mountain. David sees God as accessible. He heard and answered David's prayer. Don't miss what this verse says. He says, where does my help come from? He's crying out to the Lord, verse four, with my voice and he answered me from where? Well, from his holy mountain. Well, what's that? That's Mount Zion. That's where David's palace was. That's the place he just, he just had to escape. That's the hill that symbolizes the presence of God, where the Ark of the Covenant was, where heaven meets earth in a, in a symbolic sense. This is that holy mountain that represented Yahweh's grace with his people and the kingship of God in Israel. And David wasn't there anymore. He had no access to that place. Nowhere was more dangerous on earth. But where would David's help come from? Well, from Zion, because he knew God wasn't restricted as a local deity or as a tribal deity, but God was there and available to David, even in the wilderness. God has never had a problem ministering to exiles. God has never had a problem chasing down a wayward son because geography doesn't stump an omnipresent God. And David had his gaze fixed on God. And we have to learn to match that gaze, to look to God's character in our times of trouble because he provides us with what we need most, which is God himself, our shield, our glory, our restorer, the lifter of our head, our accessible one who hears and answers our cries from his holy mountain. That's trouble and that's trust. Let's look at the third stanza, the third couplet, verses five and six, we'll call it trouble and tranquility, trouble and tranquility. Verse five and six show us trouble and tranquility. Look with me at verse five. I lay down and I slept. I awoke for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me round about. I know what you're thinking. This is no time for sleeping, right? Also, how dangerous is it to speak of one of the two most, most troubling topics in all Sunday preaching. Sleep. The other one is lunch. Now I've brought both of them up, and I have your attention until sleep or lunch overtakes your attention. I mean, we, 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 we enjoy sleep, most of us, but we all understand that there's times when sleep is the last thing from our mind. And without getting you to think too much about sleeping at this moment, we do need to think about the theology of sleep. The point here in in verse 5 is that David's outnumbered, that many consonant with the 10,000s around him. I mean, he's in grave danger. I mean, the price on his head would have been the favor of the new king, Absalom. 
Sleep would have been tough to come by in this situation. Trouble is usually like that. We all know what it's like to be unable to sleep. The National Health Interview Survey said as many as 34% of people are affected by sleep disorders, which makes sleep a big business in our culture. And so you can buy NyQuil or z or Ambien or Tylenol PM or Unisom or Lunesta or Propofol. Careful with that last one. Drugs to give people sleep. Desperate. They want sleep so bad, they don't care. The side effects include headache, drowsiness, dizziness, nausea, muscle pain, joint pain, and death. I read in the New York Times an article about a lady in Salinas, California, who was blaming her family for eating all the food and leaving trash around. It turned out that the mouthfuls of peanut butter that were missing and the Tostitos crumbs in the bed and popsicle sticks in the ground were one of the side effects of a sleep medication she was on that was causing her to sleepwalk to the kitchen and eat large quantities of food. They didn't figure it out until she had gained 100 pounds. This is my life story, friends. <laughs> Maybe you're more natural. Natural people are customers too, right, Herb? Herbs and vitamins and hypnosis and chamomile tea and tai chi exercises and breathing techniques and something you can buy at Whole Foods called St. John's Wort, which I think I read about in the book of Revelation. <laughs> or more traditional methods like counting sheep or making your snoring husband sleep in the garage. People have tossed and turned in agitation for want of sleep, sometimes caused by fear or distress, or a guilty conscience. But in David, we see a peace that passes all understanding. We see tranquility in the midst of trouble. What a gift when he says in verse 5, I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I've heard Pastor MacArthur say a bunch of times that if the growth of the church, the holiness of its members, the salvation of the lost was ultimately up to him, he would never sleep. And he sleeps just fine. It's David-like because we understand the relationship between sleep and sovereignty. The deep sense of security marks David because the Lord sustains him. Verse 5, the Lord sustains me. It's in the imperfect tense. It means a habitual trust from David led to a habitual sustenance from God. And if ever a situation screamed for sleeplessness, if ever a situation invited insomnia where restlessness would be perfectly reasonable, it's this one we would all say David is in store for some long and sleepless nights, but because David understands the sovereignty of God, he sleeps like a baby. An idiomatic expression in English that's idiotic if you actually have a baby. Except when they do sleep. Is anything better? In its mama's arms or grandma's arms mouth kind of gaped open, eyes rolled back, just kind of twitchy-eyed, baby, just snoozing. So safe, so tranquil, no cause for weary or care, so content and calm and quietly at rest. And for David, life under Yahweh's sustaining hand taught him how to sleep. And when the morning finally came, David had slept and survived, and he gives all the credit to God who sustains him. One commentator says, God's hand is David's pillow. May it be yours as well. And when we wake in a new day, we see more of the same. God's sustaining power. Tranquility in the midst of trouble, faith in the face of fear, reminds us that God's loving care marks the difference between despair and hope. And David finds this answer by this precious gift from God, the God who never sleeps, and never slumbers. Sleep reminds us of something theological because God doesn't sleep. It reminds us that we're not him. And so as we move towards this final couplet, verses seven and eight, we can see trouble and triumph. Trouble and triumph. Verse seven, rise. Arise, O Yahweh. Save me, O my God. For thou hast smitten all my enemies on the cheek. Thou hast shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. Thy blessing be upon thy people. Selah. 
Deliverance has been on the horizon for a long time. In this psalm, the word save or help or deliver, translated in verse 2, verse 7, and verse 8, has stitched this whole song together. It's a song about salvation, and it leads to this final stanza, which is a climax of salvation. And in verse 7, we finally get to hear David's clear, actual prayer, his request, his supplication. We are his confidence in God's victory, knowing that he fights in and through his people when he says, arise, O Lord. David, by praying, arise, O Lord, is calling on an ancient prayer from the book of Numbers, chapter 10, verse 33, spoken by Moses when the Ark of the Covenant was brought before the army for war. Moses would say, rise up, O Yahweh. May your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee before you. And David borrows that appropriate phrase and says, arise, Rise, O Yahweh. He he doesn't have much of an army, a ragtag bunch. He's actually separated from his army so that uh, they don't get killed for his sake. And as he hides in pretty much lonely isolation, he prays the prayer of the commander of the army of God as if he's surrounded by 10,000 soldiers instead of 10,000 soldiers trying to kill him. And he says with every confidence, O Yahweh, rise up because he knows God God is his defender and that triumph is on the horizon. God is his deliverer. God is his savior. And so he calls on God by name to save him. Brace yourself though for the end of this prayer. The battle cry is strong, but listen to these words. You've smitten all my enemies on the cheek and have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Hey, ain't nobody singing that on Sunday. To smite the enemies on the cheek, words of contemptuous dismissal. It's a gross insult in the ancient Near East to slap someone in the face. I think pretty similar to our culture. The next phrase, shattering the teeth of the wicked, is an incredibly violent image, and interpreters uh, differ as to what it's a reference to. Interpreters talking about what it's like to be punched in the face. They're out of their depth. That's the issue. But they, they do wonder if this is about the removal of an animal's teeth to make it harmless or if it's a picture of the punishment in the ancient world for certain verbal crimes, like lying in court, uh, one of the, the, the penalties was to have your teeth broken out. I mean, this is violent. This is, this is severe. And whatever he, he has behind this metaphor, somebody is going to the dentist big time. I think my question is, are, are you ready for a prayer like that? It doesn't seem very Christian, does it? not very new covenant, or at least not very seeker sensitive. I'm afraid today's Christians might be too puny to pray like this, but we can learn from David here, and this isn't about retributive violence. This is about allegiance to Yahweh. David understands that allegiance to Yahweh, to his God, is everything. This isn't David just calling for help for David's sake. This isn't David saying he needs to punch back. David is going to plead for the life of his son Absalom. The last thing David wants is Absalom to die. But David, on behalf of the people of Israel, that's why the prayer says, thy blessing be upon thy people as its final word. David, on behalf of his people, he knows that the honor of Yahweh is at stake. He knows that the throne ultimately belongs to Yahweh. So this isn't just some antiquated Old Testament prayer because allegiance to God is still everything and God's justice is not something that's an Old Testament issue, something we're not allowed to talk about or cover up. God's justice is the reason we evangelize a lost world because if they don't come to Christ for salvation, they will be punished eternally in hell. Such were some of you. All of us were on the road to the judgment, the right and righteous judgment of God. God will judge every sinner according to their just deserves. And when we look at the holiness of God, none of us, not a single creature, by nature and choice, we're sinners. None of us stand a chance before God's judgment. This isn't an Old Testament thing. Read the martyr's prayer in the book of Revelation as they beseech God to avenge their blood. It is the right and righteous nature of God to punish evildoers. Don't get this wrong. Salvation and deliverance is a messy business involving divine righteousness, involving ultimate justice. There's a difference between the harsh and unloving kind of angry prayer that that some picture when they read this and the righteous divine judgment, because that's what this is. David uses the tenses here, smitten and shattered. When some Bibles 
translated smite the enemies, and some he has smitten the enemies. Some say he will shatter the teeth. Some say he has shattered the teeth. It's all reflective of David's confidence in the ultimate justice of God. David states it as if it's done, as if it's finished. In the middle of the wilderness, as it's being prayed, while Absalom is defiling David's palace, David's prayer has this victorious, triumphant, confident faith to it. And the rebellion would be resolved when those 20,000 rebels are killed and Absalom, in a, in a almost an embarrassing way, dies his giant hair tangled up in a tree and then some of David's disobedient commanders run spears through him. The trouble David faced cost him dearly because he, he genuinely and truly loved his rebellious son. But David would face another trial in his grief, mourning the death of that rebel son. But it was with his eyes fixed on God and on God's deliverance especially that he ends this song with a testimony and a blessing. Verse 8, salvation belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be upon your people. Selah. What do you think of that? That's a declaration of the delivered. That's a blessing that comes from a shepherd's heart. David is confident he'll be delivered, but he wants God's people to see that deliverance and be blessed to have the joy and the rejoicing and be instructed in the triumphant nature of God's salvation. At this point in their history, Israel lacked significant unity because of the strife and rebellion and coup d'etat that Absalom had brought. But David wants Israel to know and to be restored that salvation belongs to the Lord, right? That's verse eight. Salvation belongs to the Lord. David understood that his salvation wasn't found in sitting on Mount Zion in his temple. Salvation wasn't found in the throne. Salvation wasn't found in his crown. Salvation wasn't found in military strength. Salvation wasn't found in the end of this particular trial. Salvation ultimately was found in the Lord. And we need to know that in the same kind of language. There is nowhere where you can find salvation, not in a church, not in religion, not in ritual, not in good works. Salvation is still only found in the Lord. And when you trust him in trouble and you await his deliverance, perhaps you remember Psalm 3, and though you're not a king, yet the day is coming. And in the meantime, take this trust with you, this truth with you, and speak it to trouble. Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. Salvation belongs to the Lord. There was another son of David, not Absalom, but a great, 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 great grandson, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was one who was perfectly righteous, a long-awaited son, a long-awaited king, a son who knew troubles far greater than his father David had ever known. A son who was betrayed by those closest to him. A son who never did a single thing wrong. And it was on the night before he was killed that he walked that same path off Mount Zion uh, through the Kidron Valley, weeping as he went, the gospel writers tell us, and went up to the Mount of Olives. Same path David took. But he went not for himself, and he was troubled on that dark night, and he was abandoned by his friends, a prelude to a far greater abandonment as he would be drugged back outside of the city and crucified on a cross. His enemies would surround him. David says how many were his foes. They testified against him. They rose up against him, and they said, remember Matthew 27, 43, he trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. David heard the voice of his enemies. Jesus heard the voice of his enemies as he hung dying on the cross. And Jesus responded in submission to his father in perfect obedience and trust. And in Jesus' dying, he demonstrates the perfect righteousness and judgment of God. He took the penalty for our sin upon him. Jesus delivered his people from death. He is our Lord, our God, and our King. And every trial teaches us to trust this Jesus more fully. 
Romans 8, 28, which every believer loves, the promise that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, that God is working all those things together is a promise that David believed before Paul ever wrote it. And it's a promise that Jesus knew before Paul wrote it because Jesus is God. And he tells you that salvation belongs to him, that he's the one that we trust in trouble. And he'll prove it in your life over and over and over again. Because when there's trouble, there's an occasion for trust. Father, thank you for the confidence, the assurance, and the trust that we can have in the face of trouble. Thank you for this divinely inspired song. May we live according to its truth. Guard us, God, from temptation as foes surround us and we hear mocking words of ridicule. Give us trust in your presence as a shield, our sovereign God, our Savior, our strength. Give us tranquility that grants us security and peace. And God, remind us that in you alone is salvation. And God, we pray like David, arise, O Lord, rescue and restore your people. Give us trust in the face of our trials. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Well, friend, it was a joy being with you today. You are dismissed. Have a great Lord's Day as you enjoy Sunday. Sunday.